How long have you been doing this, Steve? I've been looking for a particular kind of a marine fossil called a nautiloid in Grand Canyon for about 25 years. It's taken me along about 100 miles of the Grand Canyon, and uh, I've been finding them all in one layer. So what I do is I go find the layer in the Redwall limestone where they occur, and then uh, I study the fossil content, and that's what we get. So what is a nautiloid? A nautiloid is a squid in a shell. It has a cone-shaped shell that has pressurized chambers in it, and the body of the organism is at the wide end of the shell. And the animal could swim really fast. Oh, that's pretty cool. And they're the fastest swimming predators you could imagine. How big do they get? Uh, some of these squid-like organisms are up to one foot in diameter and seven feet long. That's a pretty big <laughs> creature. About the average length of these things is about the length of your arm. Hmm. Uh, and there are small ones, medium ones, and big ones. So you found them out here somewhere? Yeah, yeah right here in the uh, limestone below us, we can see an excellent display, uh, a typical display of nautiloids. Now, look, take a look over there. You can see the, uh, the cone-shaped organism pointing oh, this yeah. way. I see it. And you can see the curved uh, chambers internal to the shell. Uh -huh. That might be originally four feet long or so. Yeah. And then I see over here, it, right in this area, and that must be one or two feet long. Yeah. And then I see the tip end of a nautiloid, very beautifully oh, preserved, cool. yeah. with the internal tube down the center. And then I see, it looks like a middle segment of a broken uh, nautiloid with the chambers coming through here. Yeah. So there's four nautiloids right there. And uh, what is that? I mean, it looks like somebody drew a circle in the rock. Yeah, it looks like a circle sitting uh, on the same plane as the other four nautiloids. Could that be a nautiloid pointing down? So it's vertical. It's fossilized in a vertical position. It is. That, that seems strange to me. Yeah, about one out of seven of the nautiloids uh, that we're finding in this layer are tip end pointing down. That, so that's not rare. Do you find that all over? Yes, and on every location where I see many nautiloids displayed, I'll always see the circle and they're pointing down. But the rest of these all seem to be pointing in the same direction. You notice that, isn't that interesting? See, I, I pointed out four nautiloids and the, they, one's pointing this way, one's pointing that way, one's pointing that way, and one's pointing this way. They, they're all in that general trend running this way across the layer, so what does that argue? It's an aligned condition of fossils. And what would cause that? I think that a current swept over this mm -hmm. deposit and it aligned them. If these organisms died a natural death and fell to the bottom of a calm and uh, placid sea, it'd be random. they would be randomly pointing, and uh, they're not. And so something swept over them and buried them. It froze very rapidly to trap a nautiloid right. in vertical orientation. Right, yeah. Well, Steve, the conventional story is that creatures are fossilized when they die, they sink to the bottom, they slowly get covered up. What is the evidence that you see here that supports the Genesis story? Well, there's a lot of uh, sediment here, you know, layers, but the nautiloids are all in this one plane of the Redwall limestone. And I've seen it through 100 miles of the canyon. And it, uh, it argues that there must be a billion nautiloids oh. around here. And uh, so there's some type of mass kill or mm -hmm. death mm -hmm. associated with this. And then the bedding surface we're looking at is consistent with that. We see the orientation or the alignment of fossils, which argues that it wasn't a natural death that killed these organisms. They didn't fall randomly to the bottom. Something swept along and moved them. Mm -hmm. Their bodies may be still in the, in the shells, and they were buried by being smothered here. So it's a mass kill on a colossal dimension in an ocean current, mm -hmm. uh, which brings to mind immediately something like a global flood. Yeah. And it seems to me also just the detail, I mean, that one fossil over there, there's just exquisite detail in that fossil. And it would seem to me that if it was a long time, I grew up on a ranch, those things decay and they decay quickly. Mm -hmm. So these must have been buried rapidly. Those are really mind challenging things. So 
uh, my original thought is they were, may have been poisoned, but now I'm thinking that they have been mm. smothered alive by this fast moving current. The fastest moving predator in the ocean is probably a nautiloid, and it can't survive uh -huh. whatever whomped on it here, some kind of current. So the fossil deposit is, uh, is kind of a Sherlock Holmes detective story. We're looking here, trying to discern the events that uh, led to the uh, killing and burial of these uh, marvelous creatures. So all of that evidence seems to uh, point back again to the history we have recorded in Genesis. Yeah, this is not uh, a common placid sea. This is not business as usual. This is something really extraordinary. So the, is this a mud layer that's rolling in here? It could be muddy. It could be very much mm -hmm. a slurry. And uh, that's another story that I'd like to tell you. All right, you lead the way. Well, this is really interesting. Uh, we're looking at the bottom part of the Redwall Limestone here in the middle of the Grand Canyon. And the top, we see the thin bedded, rather brown limestone and church strata with an abrupt boundary with the thick bedded limestone underneath it. Mm -hmm. And that upper seven feet is the nautiloid bed. And then running right down the middle of it is the coarse fossil zone. And that coarse fossil zone continues for 100 miles down the Grand Canyon. It also goes to the west out in the Lake Mead area. I've even seen this bed uh, in uh, Frenchman Mountain next to Las Vegas, Nevada, eye level with the Stratosphere Hotel. There's this uh, seven foot layer. So it's extremely uh, Very persistent mm -hmm. and uh, extensive. And we're just looking at the general characteristics of it here. So in the middle there is the nautiloid layers with all that coarse fossil material. So that corresponds to what we just saw when we saw the fossils. So we were looking down on that surface. Okay. Now we're looking at it in cross section. Well, Steve, I've heard that limestone just takes a long time to form. How do we explain this? On the Great Bahama Banks, limestone accumulates about a thousand years per inch, yeah. lime sediment and lime mud. And uh, maybe that is some people's thinking about the conventional way, but thinking about this limestone layer here in the Grand Canyon um, causes me to just jettison that idea almost immediately. Is there a difference between this and that? Oh, uh, very much idea. a difference. Remember the uh, fossils are all along one horizon yes. in the bed. Mm -hmm. They're not distributed vertically throughout the bed. And then um, you notice that it's very extensive, extremely extensive, 100, down 100 miles of canyon. And then remember the alignment of the fossils right. provide evidence of a current. Mm -hmm. Together, these three observations need of an excellent uh, and good interpretation. And uh, that led me to uh, do some very serious reflection and it challenged me to do my best work. Uh -huh. And uh, the, the, um, the experiment uh, that I had with my son, February 3rd, the year 2000, in the giant sandbox is worth talking about. With a dad and his kid with the sandbox, it started with pouring sand. And you know, pour sand, it's in friction. When you pour sand fast, it forms uh, mounds. Mm -hmm. Okay, but when you throw sand, it can stream out over a surface like a blanket. Right. And I was throwing out sand with little leaf fragments in it, thinking about nautiloids, when the idea of a high velocity flow came to my mind. Rather than thinking about granular friction, you know, the grains as they bounce along in the, in a, as you throw the grains out, the frictional flow, I imagined little springs between the sand grains holding them apart. And if that could happen, the sand could flow almost endlessly. And my brain entered a, a domain, I call it no friction land. I started thinking about high speed, no friction flow of sediment slurries, concentrated sediment slurries over the surface of the earth on low, uh, low slopes and that kind of thing. It led me into a four year thought experiment, if you will, about how sand grains and sand-sized particles and large fossils might move. How did 
the fossils, the coarse fossils, get in the middle of the bed. Mm -hmm. That is the mind-challenging thing. I could imagine how they could get at the bottom of yeah. the bed, just yeah. fall out, mm -hmm. or I could imagine how they get to the top of the bed, but how could they get in the middle? That, that was really interesting. And how'd you figure that out? Well, I'm thinking about the sand flowing out. I'm looking at those leaf fragments and I'm thinking in the wake of a, of a high speed flow, there could be a turbulent eddy and that's how the nautiloids could fall out with the sediment. Concentrated sediment would fall out first and then the, the fossils would be buoyed up and they, they, would, mm -hmm. they, they would fall out and then finally the light stuff. Uh, the, the, the finer texture would fall out. And so the, it seemed to explain things. In no friction land, I can imagine how this occurred. I, I worked out the equations in 2D of, um, of a dynamic pressure and static pressure on a fast moving flow. You know, when you have your hand out in the car right. at 60 miles an hour, you feel that really strong mm -hmm. uh, f uh, current that's flowing past your hand. That's called dynamic pressure. And a fast moving slurry, like a mud slurry with lots of, of organisms in it, would generate that kind of pressure. The faster it goes, the more pressure it develops. When that pressure developed in front is equal to the weight, the submerged weight of the flow, the mud flow, if you will, it causes a, a property called hydroplane. Hmm. And in hydroplane, there is no friction with the surface underneath. Just like what happens on the highway. Just like what on the highway. So this thing, by its speed, it generates its own cushion, if you will, mm -hmm. that m makes it detach from the earth. And it, it flows on a hydroplane. So all those particles are suspended in their same position and then traveling at a very fast rate. Yeah. So the boundaries of this thing are high shear, but the internally, this thing is very laminar mm -hmm. and it flows along almost endlessly and with low friction. And uh, so I gave it to a modeler, a computational fluid dynamicist to model that uh, condition. I gave him a couple of uh, months to do the 2D computer simulation. And I remember getting a phone call one day and uh, I, I said, how are you doing on that, uh, that computational fluid dynamics problem of simulating an underwater mud flow? 50% sediment, 50% water, moving uh, at a, a speed of about seven meters per second, 21 feet per second, something like that. And he said, wow, they fly. Huh. And then he noticed they generated a wing shape as these uh, flows moved under the water over the sediment surface, they generate a wing shape and they essentially fly. So now we have flying sediment flows on a hydroplane moving over the ocean floor. And so we can get material then transported very long distances. Yeah, and very fast. And then the breakup of the wake of this flow creates the conditions that allow the nautiloids and the other coarse fossils to fall out in the middle of the flow. Is that towards the tail of this then? The, the tail of the flow. Uh -huh. And so that theory has now been modeled in computer and it seems to explain the, the, the essentials of uh, what this is like. Well, then everything is happening very quickly. This sediment sequence can be explained and modeled uh, by uh, computational fluid dynamics uh, very quickly, minutes, not millions of years. So it's a completely different explanation for the origin of limestone layers. And it's not just the limestone layers. I mean, we've been here in the canyon for a number of days, and it seems like everywhere we look, whether we're talking about the layers all being laid down rapidly, and all the evidence to show that it was a rapid deposition, and then the carving of the canyon, the evidence shows that happened rapidly, all the way down to the mud flows and how those form rapidly. With all of that evidence before us, why do people still hang on to the conventional model? I think it's not because of the sedimentary evidence, ultimately, I think it's something else. Most people have a high regard for radioisotope dating, and maybe that's the last uh, part of their thinking about millions of years. And so we need to talk about that subject as well. Well, that's always been a tough issue. Uh, do you wanna talk about that? Well, I have a friend 
Andrew Snelling, he's a geologist uh, from Australia who uh, has done some dating on Grand Canyon rocks with me. I know, Andrew, I floated down the river with him, so I'll look forward to seeing him again. Well, before we go, though, we started out talking about the history in the rocks, and these rocks have told us a story. A powerful story, haven't they? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the children of Israel were crossing into the Promised Land, 1,400 B.C., mm -hmm. And as they crossed uh, the Jordan River, it dried up. And Joshua said, hey, pick up 12 stones, pile these up in Gilgal. Uh, these stones will uh, be uh, a monument. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then Joshua said, uh, when your sons and daughters ask what mean these stones, you shall tell them they are a monument or memorial to the great things that God has done. Mm -hmm. And boy, right here in the Grand Canyon, we have a monument or memorial to the great things that God has done in creation and the flood. Mm -hmm. They're memorial to the judgment of God, are they not? Ultimately, and, and it's a, a beautiful world that was judged, and then look at the, the product for us to study today, yeah. and the testimony about the character of God here in the rocks, in the, of all places, the, yeah. the Grand Canyon. Right. And just like God, he will take uh, the great destruction that is evident here and turn it into something beautiful. Yes. Yeah. That's the grace of God. Well, unfortunately, it's getting late. Well, I'd like to stay here a long time, but I guess we better go. Well, Dell, I'd love to show you many more uh, rock formations here in Grand Canyon. I would love to see them. And uh, there are many places with nautiloids. Uh, there is the Coconino Sandstone. There is the, uh, the Kaibab. Mm -hmm.